Um, today I'm going to talk about quantum computation in the light of von Neumann's geometry. And uh, what uh, my aim is, is to connect uh, um, some uh, uh, background assumptions which von Neumann makes uh, in his uh, uh, series of lectures about continuous geometry of 1937 and some new fields in the uh, in computation, quantum computation. You don't see it, so the slides. Can you see them now? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I can see them. Now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So, uh, what I was saying uh, was that uh, I will uh, take some background uh, interpretational principles from phenomenal geometry and show how they apply to uh, some fields uh, of quantum computation, in particular continuous variable quantum computation, and is there still time? Uh, some results about entanglement and complexity classes uh, connected with uh, uh, the so called Sirison problem. Now, um, the Main point is the following. The algebraic approach and mathematical modelization of uh, several uh, fields in physics and in computation, in particular quantum computation, has provided med many modeling techniques connecting computational networks and uh, mathematical structures. So for example, we can represent a qubit state as a unitary state vector on a complex Hilbert space. And uh, logical gates uh, are basically correlated with uh, quantum observable, uh, quantum operations. So for example, rotations in our state space. Now, the way our operators act on these mathematical entities can give us actually some knowledge uh, about what would happen if we perform the associated computational process on the qubit uh, uh, we are working with in our um, experimental uh, in our experimental context, so to say. So, uh, what I will try to show is actually how we can rely on the mathematical model and the geometrical properties of our representational space uh, in order to derive these uh, conclusions. Now, an example of uh, the use of geometrical models uh, in quantum computation, in discrete quantum computation, uh, we already saw it, is block sphere. We already saw it in the Professor Kufaro, uh, Kufaro sorry, um, lecture. And uh, uh, basically, this is a uh, it derives from uh, the uh, homomorphism from the uh, complex Hilbert space to the uh, to the uh, two-dimensional sphere uh, with additional constraints, constraints such as that each point of the block sphere uh, is in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the state vectors which we alternatively can represent on um, our complex Hilbert space. Uh, antipodal points on the sphere correspond to opposite states. Uh, um, there is a continuous probability distribution, uh, a continuous probability function, sorry, which we have to define on the surface of the sphere in order to ascribe some probability uh, to each of the points, so to each of the states. And also, a states represented by points on the sphere with the same latitude must have the same probability of occurrence in this model. And this is our quite a low quality uh, picture of the block sphere taken from Nielsen and Chuang. Uh, now, the main problem is how can we define the mathematical geometrical representation model for our computational process? Now, for sure, when we have to choose a geometrical model, uh, the first thing we have to do is to see which kind of model will be more helpful for pragmatic reasons, uh, depending on what we want to actually to perform. So, uh, depending on what is the result of the computation which we want to obtain. So the strategy in the sense is first to define the representational space determined by the chosen model, among many others, and then we introduce the mathematical representations of the, um, the mathematical representational states uh, as elements of this space. This means that uh, when we uh, put ourselves from the perspective of the, of the geometrical model, Space properties, so topological and metrical properties defined on the representational space, define the way physical entities are represented mathematically. Uh, for example, a very rough example is uh, coordinate systems, uh, so the polar representation of states and the Cartesian representation of states, they are two equivalent representations for the same object, that, but we might want to use one over the other uh, depending on what we want to achieve. And secondly, uh, space properties indeed must meet pragmatic and experimental needs. Now, generally, when we talk about uh, quantum computation, we uh, refer to uh, discrete spectrum uh, operators, which are uh, associated with our computational networks, and finite dimensional Hilbert spaces as representational spaces in our geometrical model. But many um, observables in quantum mechanics, in general quantum theory, uh, have continuous spectra. 
also they span an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Now, in general, when we try to generalize uh, the, to um, give a higher dimension to our representational space, we have several problems, which are basically convergence, completeness, and boundless conditions over the space. Uh, in the case of Hilbert spaces, completeness and convergence are uh, not uh, problematic at all because of the definition of a, Hil of a Hilbert space, but boundless conditions, uh, bounded operators might be actually be a problem because uh, some operators in an infinite dimensional Hilbert, uh, Hilbert space might be unbounded. Uh, this is connected with an assumption made for, by von Neumann in, 19, seven, uh, in 1927, that, um, which is quite problematic actually, that uh, all physical observables in quantum mechanics must uh, be represented by bounded operators on the Hilbert space, but eventually we can discuss about it. Uh, which, it is a collateral uh, problem, but we might discuss it uh, eventually during the question time. Now, the main problem is, can a quantum computation approach continuous infinite spectrum operators so that the computation converges in a reasonable amount of time? Because so, uh, some uh, uh, continuous spectrum operators, for example, position and momentum, can actually be decomposed in a sequence of, uh, um, in a series of projections. Um, but the main problem is, how does this affect the complexity of our computational task and what, are, uh, what is the kind of knowledge, what information we can actually uh, gain from uh, uh, our geometrical model, from the geometrical model which we are using. Now we have two options in this case. The first option is to avoid entirely the problem, so to redefine the relation between our computational task and the, and the uh, geometrical model. But this might be too extreme because it has also consequences, also some impact in the uh, mathematical formalism employed in uh, uh, general uh, in orthodox quantum mechanics from a physical point of view. Uh, or a second option, which is actually the one I prefer, is to try to make sense uh, of this representation. And I'll do this, uh, I hope, hopefully, um, through von Neumann's view. Now, von Neumann, uh, as we all know, had a strong view about axiomatics. Uh, in his paper uh, with uh, Hilbert and uh, Nordheim of 1927, he states that uh, the way to this theory, so quantum theory, is as follows. Certain physical demands on these probabilities are suggested by our past experiences and trends, and this satisfaction necessitates certain relations between these probabilities. Secondly, one seeks a simple analytic apparatus in which quantities occur that satisfy precisely the same relations. This analytic apparatus, which is basically the mathematical model, and with it the operands occurring in it, now undergoes a physical interpretation on the basis of the physical demands. In doing so, the aim is to fully formulate the physical demands of that the analytic apparatus is clearly defined. This way is thus that of an axiomatization, as has been carried out, for example, with geometry and uh, going on, through the axioms, the relations between the elements of geometry, point line plane, are characterized, and then it is shown that these relations are exactly satisfied by the an analytic apparatus, namely the linear equations of quantum mechanics. Through it, one can, get, one can again recover geometric propositions uh, uh, from the properties of the linear equations. And in the new quantum mechanics, one formally assigns a mathematical element, which is in the first uh, instance, a mere operand as a representative according to a certain specification of each of the mechanical quantities, but from which one can receive statements about the representatives of other quantities and thus, through back translating, statements about real physical things. Now, what does this mean? This means that, first of all, we have to define some physical constraints uh, based on our experimental results and our exper uh, the experimental uh, context. Then we define, we find a model, a mathematical model, satisfying those physical constraints, and if it satisfies them, then we can say that our mathematical apparatus, our mathematical geometrical model in this situation, uh, has uh, a physical interpretation in von Neumann's view. And this is quite useful in order to understand what he does when he tries to expand, to extend his previous work on operator algebras in 1937 in this series of lectures about continuous geometry. Now, by definition, a continuous geometry is a complete complemented and modular lattice, satisfying this axiom, which he calls a continuity axiom. So to say it is basically um, a condition um, on uh, boundness of on boundness of uh, sub lattices of our um, lattice L, which is a general lattice in particular, then he analyzes projective lattices. So uh, for each sub lattice S of L, uh, we have uh, um, both uh, least upper bound 
uh, sub of s and inf of s, which is the greatest lower bound. Now, uh, as uh, uh, Jeffrey Bob um, suggests uh, when commenting this paper, um, the Birkhoff von Neumann paper, uh, which is the paper on uh, operator algebras in quantum logic, does not explicitly consider systems with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Uh, that is, fields or systems in which the concept of temperature is irrelevant. Uh, hence, they refer to the logical structure of quantum systems as a sort of objective geometry. In the case of systems with a finite number of degrees of freedom, the logical structure is a perspective geometry, isomorphic to the projective geometry of all subspaces of a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And for, the system, uh, for systems with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, von Neumann later proposed a structure which is a generalization of projective geometry, which is indeed um, continuous geometry. Now, how does, uh, how does he uh, do this? Uh, basically, uh, first of all, he defines a relation between uh, um, the images of the functions, which are the elements of the algebra he's considering, and uh, um, set theoretic inclusions in order to define a partial order on the uh, algebra so that he can basically elasticify uh, the entire algebra, so the set of functions defined in our Hilbert space, which is a functional space that I didn't set before, but it is implicit. Um, now, the main problem is that Jeffrey Bob defines uh, uh, von Neumann's approach to continuous geometry as a geometry with no points, which is quite a vogue uh, expression. It is not so clear what Jeffrey Bob means. Um, how to make sense of this definition, because it is very important in the um, description then of the stabilizer formalism applied to quantum uh, to continuous variable quantum computation. Now um, we can distinguish actually two different kinds of paradigms when we uh, construct when we build a, a geometrical uh, model from no from nothing. We have a Euclidean approach, so to say, and a Leibniz approach. Now the Euclidean approach starts with a set of individuated property bearing points, so they are full entities, so to say which set is endowed with some topological and metrical relations. So we built our uh, topological space as a container of this point. So the re topological relations are defined on the basis of the properties of the point. But on the Leibnizian approach, on the other hand, we have the same, uh, we have basically the opposite direction. Uh, so the, the Leibnizian approach is based on Leibniz's work in uh, the Caracteristica Geometrica. Um, Basically, we start with a set of empty uh, entities, which are places, uh, non-individuated uh, um, uh, entities, which uh, have no property ascribed to them before uh, the representational phase, so to say, the representational step. And uh, we endow these places with some topological relations in order to construct some, uh, some kind of uh, topological structure. And then we add some points into these places so that the representation of these points, the mathematical representation of them, is determined by the topological structure which we introduced before, at the step before. And this second approach might justify how we can have a geometry with the points. We would have a geometry of the uh, topological structure, indeed, of this um, of this algebra, uh, and this is basically what von Neumann actually does, because von Neumann focuses on the properties of variables for functions, uh, rather than on how points are actually transformed under their action. Uh, in order to be clear, for example, you can assume that all the functions which we are dealing with in our algebra are basically projections, in order to simplify the, the situation. And the mathematical properties, uh, define mathematical relations, define the uh, space structure in our geometrical model. Then these functions are applied to specific points, individu individuated points which we introduced in our space, which are ascribed uh, instances of the previous properties, geometrical properties. Knowing the special properties ascribed to functions on the space, we can get, we can have um, uh, indirect knowledge of what would happen when points are transformed by that, uh, by instances of those uh, variables or functions. And there are several situations, several um, attempts to develop some kind of pointless geometry in topology, for example, and also there is a, a little bit of discussion in the, in the philosophical landscape by uh, a paper of Arsenius on uh, gang topology and uh, uh, the um, program against pointillism, so to say, of, Jeffrey, uh, of uh, Butterfield, Jeremy Butterfield.
Now, the most important contribution of von Neumann in this sense is the introduction of a dimension function, which is uh, a clear example of how to ascribe properties to um, uh, variables for functions. A function d from the algebra to the uh, real numbers is a dimension function if and only if given two elements of the algebra, uh, these two conditions hold. So uh, the range uh, d of, uh, of a has either an upper bound or a lower bound, and this uh, relation d of uh, the dimension of a plus b plus the dimension of a times b is equal to the dimension of a plus the dimension of b. So this other relation holds. And also we can define point, pointwise additivity um, by considering a sequence uh, of independent elements of the algebra. So basically a sequence of functions. Uh, now, apparently, however, um, somehow a contradiction might arise because basically the dimension function ascribes a real value, so non-integer value, which is highly important, uh, to a function, say f, which is the dimension of f's range. From a set theoretical point of view, this range is just a set endowed with additional structure. But from the naive set theory, set theoretical point of view, this set is just a collection of objects which might perfectly be individuated property bearing points. And therefore, the dimension function would ascribe a real value to a set of points. So we basically went nowhere. But we actually drew a distinction between variables for functions and applied functions. And we also, uh, and I also addressed this point, which we might have actually uh, sets of uh, collections of empty entities, such as places. So the contradiction should not rise at all because we would never have point three. For Neumann's geometry in particular, when, when applied to quantum computation and to quantum mechanics, shifts the focus from a state vector centered model to an operator centered one. And uh, also, um, dimension functions are highly important because uh, when we talk about von Neumann's factors. Uh, now, factors of particular kind of von Neumann algebras with trivial center, meaning that uh, basically the center is uh, um, a multiple of the identity element of the algebra. Um, on the base of the dimension of identity element, uh, we can classify these factors in three different kinds due to the um, Murray and von Neumann classification theorem, which is the following one. Now we have uh, uh, type one algebras, which are basically um, those algebras where the um, identity element is uh, uh, an atom. So it is finite. Then we have uh, uh, fin semi-finite uh, factors where the identity major has at least one finite projection. And we also have uh, type two one factors and type two uh, infinity factors. And finally, we have a third kind of algebras, which is uh, type three, three factors. Now, I don't have the time to go uh, on all the presentation of phenomenal algebras, but basically this is the idea. And the most important aspect is that this kind of algebras, when we wait, talk about- Wait, Enrico, Enrico, sorry, sure. beg your pardon for interrupting you. Richard sure. has a question. So mm -hmm. he asked if you can define majorization. Sure. Uh, basically, majorization in this case is a um, partial order, a partial order relation. So uh, there is an element of the algebra which is greater or greater than uh, um, uh, other elements of the algebra itself, uh, of the algebra of the factor. Basically, I don't know if it's clear enough. If I'm clear enough, it is quite a rough definition actually. Because That's very great. Thanks. I'm okay. sorry, you should drop you today. <laughs> I no, no, yeah, because I was saying it is quite a rough definition because there are actually um, more complicated expression, more complicated ways to explain phenomenal algebra. So I try to uh, simplify them as much as possible because also there is a fourth kind of factors which we will see um, in the entanglement part, in the entanglement section, which is um, hyperfinite factors, but we will see that, uh, that later. Basically, um, this might be important, this might be uh, interesting. Um, Type one uh, and factors um, have atoms. In the case of projective lattices, uh, th those atoms are basically projected uh, or project uh, projections uh, onto one-dimensional uh, subspaces of the Hilbert space. So, for example, there is Laura Roche in her book about quantum mechanics and quantum and uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, who states that. Those projections are basically what we employ in our mathematical, what we use in our mathematical model in order to describe measurements.
Um, so when we relate factors with dimensions, we have that um, non-integer dimensions basically pop out of no from nothing. So according to von Neumann's definition of, of the dimension function, we will have type 2, 1 and type 2 uh, infinity factors uh, wh whose dimension goes from 0 to 1 in the first case and from 0 to infinity in the other case. And this highly influences the way we can actually structure, we can actually define the topological relations in our, on our representation space. Therefore, there is a connection between the structure of our space and the kind of information which we can represent on it. And also, there is a second connection between the chosen function, so basically the chosen factor, and the range of possible experimental results which we can gain. Because um, generally, when we talk about discrete quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, um, we have a nagging basis for a given operator, which is uh, whose cardinality basically uh, gives us uh, the number of possible results which we can gain from a measurement process. Because then uh, the elements of the spectrum of the operator uh, um, are the possible outcomes indeed, for, uh, which we get when we interact uh, through, a through a measurement device uh, on, um, with that particular system. So in this situation, we would allow also uh, continuous spectra. And this might be problematic in some way, in particular when we deal with quantum, computation, uh, quantum computational tasks. Now, um, in uh, his paper of uh, 2004, David Deutsch from Qubit um, basically focuses the problem of defining what, are, what is the starting point of the computational process. And he states that uh, it is continuous observables that don't fit naturally into formalism. Because mainly we have a problem of approximation through numer numerical methods, uh, which might increase, it, is, uh, it has to be proved uh, of course, but it might increase the complexity of our problem. Uh, or it might actually um, higher the uh, time which we must uh, use in order to obtain uh, an answer to a given question, whether it is a dichotomous question or not. Now, uh, Deutsch introduces um, an important notion, which is the computational state of the network, meaning that the computation, the computation uh, as a whole is an emergent phenomenon from uh, um, the sequence of quantum gates which we use uh, in our network. And then, based on the description of the networks which we, which we use, um, we can uh, ascribe uh, some kind of state, we'll see, them, uh, we'll see that later, to the whole network. And this is quite useful when we want to treat uh, stabilizers, actually. So we already talked about stabilizers, so I will go very quickly on this section, also because I don't know how much time I have left. So basically, a stabilizer is an operator which leaves a state unchanged. We have the polygroup, uh, um, of n-fold tensor products of polymatrices, um, which is used when we have to define the Clifford group for uh, stabilizer formulas in the case of, um, of Gottes manual uh, operators. We also have a um, stabilized vector space, meaning that all the elements of this vector space, Vs, are stabilized by the generators of a, sub, of a subgroup of Gm. In this case, I called it S. And the polygroup, which is the normalized, so the meaning of the set of all the unit operators, um, leaving basically the transformations of the polygroup unchanged. Now, the stabilizer formalism primarily allows, as Gottesman uh, suggests, to reduce the complexity of some problems from exponential time to polynomial time. An arbitrary transformation of a continuous variable requires basically an infinite number of real parameters in order to be defined, as Lloyd and Branstein uh, um, noticed in 1999. So we first of all have a problem of approximation. And also, we might want to use the same mathematical tools of discrete quantum uh, computation in the case of continuous variables. Uh, so we have to, uh, to adopt, so to say, to uh, change uh, our geometrical model in the case of uh, discrete quantum computation and adapt it to the case of continuous variable quantum computation. And the way we do this is, to, uh, is by analyzing the stabilizers in terms of the algebras we generate them. Because in the continuous, uh, in the continuous variable situation, um, we have to consider an analogous of the polygroup, which is called the Heisenberg polygroup. Uh, it consists of phase space displacements 
operators for n qubits, and it is a continuous group, a continuous slide group, uh, generated by a set of operators forming the homonymous uh, algebra, so the Heisenberg tile algebra. Now, an example of this uh, in the case of HW1 is uh, this operator, which is X of alpha, uh, which basically uh, is a, uh, shifts the position, it basically translates the, our state vector on our representational space. Then we have to consider a second algebra, which is SP2NR, of homogeneous quadratic polynomial Hamiltonians expressed in terms of the position and momentum operators, QI and PI, which are the components, basically, um, consisting of squeezing transformations and interaction Hamiltonians. And we generate the group, the associated group of this um, algebra, SP algebra, and then we can recover a Clifford group for CD quantum computation. This is basically what um, Barlett, Saunders, Brownstein, and Nemoto do, uh, which is the Clifford group, which is basically the semi-direct product of the uh, heisenberg val group and uh, uh, together with the SP group. Now, the Clifford group indeed consists of space -based, uh, phase space displacements and squeezing transformations. Now, translations coming from the heisenberg weil group, phase shifts and squeezers allow the construction of any quadratic Hamiltonian in terms of P and Q. And we can actually implement these operators through nonlinear operations in order to approximate any Hamiltonian written as a polynomial um, of, a continuous set, uh, of a set of continuous variables so that, so that uh, uh, we can actually build, according to these uh, authors, uh, um, some continuous variable analogs of um, some um, discrete, discrete computational uh, quantum gates, which are basically F, which is the analog of the Adamar, uh, of the Adamar gate, some uh, the analog of C0, and then P gamma, which is basically a phase gate, shifting uh, the, our state vector of a factor gamma. And then we have that uh, our Clifford algebra, uh, our Clifford group actually, NGN, is basically generated by uh, these uh, um, quantum gates. So we can actually recover some results of discrete quantum computation since any CD process expressed in terms of the Clifford group can be modeled by following the evolution of the generators of, this poly, uh, of the, uh, these poly operators, which is basically the same principle uh, used in the discrete, it is quite similar to the principle used in the, um, the stabilizer formulas for discrete quantum computation. And for each of the n generators stabilizing the initial state, uh, one must keep track basically of uh, 2n real coefficients only. Now, some philosophical problems, however, arise, which are, first of all, uh, mathematically it is impossible to distinguish the um, state, psi, and the, the stabilized state, because basically a of psi is just equal to psi. However, Two differences must be noted, which are an epistemical difference and a pragmatic difference. Uh, from an epistemical point of view, indeed, the stabilized state is the result of a, of a calculation procedure. So um, it, um, it is the result of a um, operational, so to say, uh, procedure made by someone, made by a calculator, for example. And also the stabilized state gave us some information about the operator's effect on the state rather than on the state itself, properly speaking, meaning that that state is a stabilizer of the, of the uh, well, the, that operator, sorry, is a stabilizer of psi. And also there is a pragmatic difference because we might want to look just for operator with certain properties associated to certain quantum gates. Also, this might reduce, as, um, as it was suggested by Gottsman, it might reduce actually the, the computational complexity of our uh, continuous variable quantum computation. And also, we have to grant some correspondence principles, which uh, if you see it uh, um, with attention, if you pay attention, are quite similar in their foundation from what we actually derive in the case of phenomenon's geometry, in the case of a geometry with no points. So in, uh, in the possibility of gaining some kind of knowledge, an epistemic, an epistemic state, so to say, um, from uh, uh, basically a mathematical model. Enrico, sorry, sorry someone... you have five minutes. Left. Yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, I will. Okay, well, I will finish basically this uh, section, and then maybe I can say just two things uh, very quickly about entanglement. Uh, 
Uh, now, basically, what does this mean? Uh, it means that the, um, the evolution of the stabilizers, in the case of continuous variables as well, uh, is endowed with epistemic value from an operator-based point of view. So the properties of these operators constrain also the geometrical properties of the representation of space associated with uh, a continuous variable quantum computation. In particular, the principle can be stated as follows. The action of a stabilizer, so in our geometrical model, on an element in the state space results in a mathematical entity which represents the outcome of a QNAT, which is the uh, continuous analog of a qubit, being processed by an associated sequence of quantum gates. So the sequence of calculi of the action of stabilizers and the sequence of the computational steps with a qubit undergoes, um, undergoes in a network, which a qubit undergoes in a network, are parallel correlated with each other. So we can go th uh, from the mathematical model, basically from the geometrical model to uh, our computational model and back again through back translation. So following the properties of the stabilizer, it is possible to infer some results about corresponding computational process at time t, also because we know that uh, uh, stabilized states are unique, uh, given a set of stabilizer, and uh, uh, given a computational process on a, on a QNIT, there exists a set of stabilizers for the state's representation generated by the algebra on the representation space. And these principles ground the possibility of studying the system state through the stabilizing functions for their representations. And from these functions, it emerges what we before uh, what we uh, call the, the computational state of our network before now uh, what about entanglement very generally uh, very quickly um, we have uh, basically a problem in the represent in the mathematical and geometrical representation of entanglement because uh, orthodox quantum mechanics tells us that uh, it can be represented through tensor products but quantum field theory actually advances another proposal, uh, which is the uh, field representation. So we, uh, instead of using tensor products, we actually use um, commuting operators defined on uh, uh, separated regions of the same Minkowski space time. This uh, implies, first of all, an ontological problem. What are we dealing with and what uh, we actually prefer to deal with? And secondly, a uh, complexity problem because uh, one representation might reduce the complexity of our problem over the other. And this is exactly what uh, is done by what the G at Alia, which is, um, who wrote a paper uh, this year in 2020, actually tried to do. Uh, this is the formal description, we don't have the time. Basically, it means uh, uh, that the probability distributions might be different in some way. And Sirison indeed studies the, these uh, uh, sets of behaviors, as he calls, it, uh, as he calls them, which are uh, normalized probability functions and the normalized probability distributions. And uh, what is at stake here is whether uh, the closure of the set of quantum behaviors, meaning those probability distributions uh, which are represent, which uh, receive a, a tense representation, is actually, is actually, uh, is actually the same extension of the set of um, quantum commuting behaviors, meaning all those uh, states which, uh, which we associate probability distributions to uh, defined by a field representation. And what is actually shown is that in the infinite dimensional case, it is not confirmed. It is dependent on an assumption uh, uh, from a factor, algebra, uh, factor theory, which is quantum embedded conjecture, um, talking about the topo uh, basically the topological properties of our representational space through the theorem, Junger theorem. Uh, so if the conjecture is true, then Sirison's problem has a positive answer. They do this, thing, uh, I will sketch very <laughs> roughly, but, well, basically they translate uh, the problem, uh, Sirison's problem in computational terms. Uh, it is, uh, as you can see, this is the paper from G, and it is basically a 100, uh, 160 pages paper, so there is no time to go along all the details of the proof, but they use uh, the non-local game um, the no local game description um, in order to reduce to, in order to uh, reduce some problems to others. So we have the class MIP um, star, which is a class of all languages uh, decided by a classical polynomial verifier entangled with a quantum prover. They show that uh, MIP star is equal to the, the class of all recursively enumerable languages, and then they try to reduce the halting set problem to um, the problem of deciding whether a certain probability distribution belongs to the set gamma uh, of QB, which is, uh, which I defined before. So the set of probability distributions um, with tensor representation, apparently, 
it follows that it is not possible to do so because we all know that the halting, the halting set is uh, um, undecidable, basically. So we can't, uh, so this uh, argument goes on, uh, uh, goes on uh, um, concluding that we cannot provide an algorithmic procedure in order to define whether a probability distribution belongs to this set or not. So this, uh, to the set, uh, to the closure of gamma QB, Therefore, Tsirusun's problem has a negative answer. Therefore, embedded conjecture has a negative answer as well. So this changes the way we define our representational space. And it's the kind of information we can manipulate mathematically. And this is an example, actually, of how also it is not only pragmatic reasoning which determines the kind of, of geometrical model which we can use, but also um, there might be some constraints uh, imposed by the, our computational power, basically, um, coming from complexity theory, uh, such as the situation in which we can't use uh, hyperfinite to hyperfinite to uh, type two one uh, um, factors uh, embedded in uh, ultra products of these uh, kind of factors, which is basically what Conner's conjecture uh, states. Uh, so thank you for the time.